Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast. Join Corbin and Alan, along with guest hosts, as they bring their love for the cinema to discuss films from every genre and decade. Learn about the history of the film, little-known facts, and insightful explorations while they enjoy discussing your favorite film. The curtain is rising and your podcast is starting. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your guide to the silver screen. Hi, this is your host, Corbin, your guide for director Tony Gilroy's 2012 sequel, The Bourne Legacy. Clocking in at 135 minutes, this is the longest film in the franchise. Before we get into the making of the film, allow me to take you back to 2012 to remember the top movies released that year. They were Django Unchained, The Avengers, The Dark Knight Rises, which Alan and I just reviewed, The Hunger Games, The First Hobbit, Wreck-It Ralph, Skyfall, Life of Pi, The Amazing Spider-Man, Pitch Perfect, Men in Black 3, which we have also reviewed, and one of my favorites, John Carter. As you can see, 2012 was a very big year for cinema. Trilogies were coming to a close. Franchises were just being started. It was a huge year for movies. At the 2012 Oscars, the best picture that year went to Thomas Langman's The Artist. The Bourne Legacy takes its name from the 2004 novel by Eric von Lustbader. At the time of publication, Robert Ludlum, the creator of Jason Bourne, had passed away, and his estate had designated Lustbader to carry on the Bourne mantle. In keeping with the series tradition, aside from the title, the works share no similarities. After the 2008 box office hit The Bourne Ultimatum, Jason Bourne appeared to have gone dormant for the foreseeable future. Despite talk that Matt Damon and Paul Greengrass were tossing around a fourth installment, their package deal made things tough for Universal. If Greengrass wasn't coming back, well, then neither was Damon. As I reported in the guide to The Bourne Ultimatum, it's no secret Greengrass and Damon didn't like Tony Gilroy who wrote the first two films and whose screen story was used for the third. Finally, in 2009, Damon confirmed he would not return to Bourne 4, since Greengrass officially confirmed he wasn't coming on board to direct. In a statement on IGN, Greengrass explained, You won't find a more devoted supporter of the Bourne franchise than me. I'm very proud of those films and feel they express everything I most passionately believe about the possibility of making quality movies in the mainstream. He continued, My decision to not return a third time as director is simply about the feeling the call for a different challenge. There's been no disagreement with Universal Pictures. The opportunity to work with the Bourne family again is a difficult thing to pass up, but we have discussed this together and they have been incredibly understanding and supportive. Jason Bourne existed before me, and will continue, and I hope to remain involved in some capacity as the series moves on. Now, oddly enough, the two had reunited after Bourne 3 for the political war thriller Green Zone. Initially, Damon assumed the next film in the series would in fact be a prequel, and that he likely wouldn't return to the character until 2015. He was close, he didn't return until 2016. With Greengrass and Damon gone, the obvious decision was to seek out Gilroy to come back on board to write and direct. Why was it obvious? The same year of Born 3, Gilroy released his film Michael Clayton, which he wrote and directed starring George Clooney in the titular role. Surprisingly, this film, which Gilroy initially had trouble getting off the ground, went on to be nominated for seven Oscars in major categories. Best Picture, Best Actor for Clooney, Best Supporting Actor, Best Directing for Gilroy, Best Writing for Gilroy, and Best Original Score for James Newton Howard, and winning one award for Best Supporting Actress. Gilroy himself was nominated twice that night. This is important to note because The Bourne Ultimatum also appeared at the 2008 Oscars. It did win three awards, but they were in technical categories. Neither Damon nor Greengrass were nominated. It is significant to state that Gilroy only gave a screen story for the third Bourne film. He put most of his passion and time into Michael Clayton, which was, as I said, huge at the awards. And despite Bourne 3 being a critical success, 
it didn't get the same love that Michael Clayton got at the Oscars. So not only did Gilroy return, but he brought with him his brother, Dan Gilroy, to co-write, and his other brother, John Gilroy, to edit, replacing Oscar winner Christopher Rouse. He also brought on James Newton Howard to score the film. About the fourth film, Without Matt Damon, Gilroy said in an interview with Collider and the Washington Post separately, It was very important to me, extremely important to me, that everything that had happened before be well preserved and be enhanced if possible by what we're doing now. You could never replace Matt Damon as Jason Bourne. This isn't James Bond. You can't do a prequel. You can't do any of those kinds of things because there was never any cynicism attached to the franchise. And that was the one thing they had to hang on to. On Friday, August 3rd, 2012, five years after the third installment, audiences finally returned to the world of Jason Bourne, albeit without him. So what was their reaction? Well, it wasn't good. Scores and box office numbers across the board took a sharp drop from the last film, plus previous installments. Currently, the film holds a watery 6.7 on IMDb, a series low 2.8 on Letterboxd, a generally positive 61 Metascore, and 56% of critics approved of the film and 58% of audiences on Rotten Tomatoes. Compared to last time, these scores are very bad. Audiences straight out of the theater gave the film a B, a franchise low. The film had a series high budget of $125 million. With no surprise, it did open number one at the box office with a measly $38 million in over 3,700 theaters. It went up against the campaign and Hope Springs. The top five that weekend were The Bourne Legacy, The Campaign, The Dark Knight Rises, Hope Springs, and Total Recall. The film would have a franchise low domestic gross of $113 million, a solid foreign gross of $162.9 million for a worldwide total of $276 million. A major box office disappointment for Universal. The film did make a profit of $151 million, but factoring in marketing costs, it didn't warrant a sequel. Thank you listeners for coming along with me as I have been your guide to the production and impact of the film. Now that you have your guide to the Bourne legacy, make sure to subscribe to the podcast for Alan and I's full review coming next Monday. And tune in the week after as we explore the fifth and possibly final installment, Jason Bourne. Hey listeners, it's Corbin. Don't forget to check out the exciting links in the description below that will connect you with more great movie reviews for your listening pleasure and our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter page. And of course, our official website where you can read great articles and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Also, if you want exclusive bonus content such as extra movie reviews, movie commentaries, and our thoughts on the latest movie news and trailers, plus more, then check out our Patreon page. It's a great way to help keep this show free, and it gives you great content that's yours to keep. All of that and more is found in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe whether you're on YouTube, Apple, Google, or Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. And while you're at it, please leave us a five-star review so other movie lovers can more easily find our podcast. We love talking about movies, and we love talking about them with you. So don't forget to share with your friends and family, and we'll see you next week, listeners. The Silver Screen Guide podcast is edited and produced by Alan and Corbin. Intro and outro music is created by Thomas Rankin. The thoughts and opinions herein expressed are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent those held by Silver Screen Guide. Silver Screen Guide is not affiliated with any company or individual involved with the creation of this movie or TV show. No portion of the podcast may be used without express written permission from Silver Screen Guide.